Uh, testing, one, two, can everyone hear me? Everyone's good? Okay, so, dear friends and guests, compañeros y compañeras, comrades und genossen, uh, my name is Daniel Gutierrez and I would like to welcome you all to an event that Antia, Henning and I put much careful and considerate labor into developing. It is our sincere hope that this event will allow an interchange that can bring fresh perspectives in the struggles that we cast in Germany. That said, I'd like to thank Antia, my partner, who I'm standing in front of, um, uh, for her incredible patience and perseverance in being able to organize this event while juggling the still fresh responsibility of parenthood, and to Henning for taking seriously what began as barside banter, um, and to the Interventionistische Linke for giving me a political home and a priceless political education, and of course, Luxembourg Magazine for putting their faith in our abilities to develop a good talk. Let's rewind to November 2007 as my family huddled in a living room in Southern California. We stood before the television and watched quivering after Obama won and spoke at a rally proclaiming, tonight we proved once more that the true strength of our nation comes not from the might of our aims or the scale of our wealth, but from the enduring power of our ideals, democracy, liberty, opportunity, and unyielding hope. Eight years later, I ask, what of these ideals as we trudge in the very marrow of the Trump years? To bridge then and now is to speak of one thing, crisis, but crisis how and where and in what forms. I am haunted by the words of a certain hunchback Italian um, that rotted in a prison cell in the last great wave of materialism. At a certain point in their historical lives, social classes become detached from their traditional parties. In other words, the traditional parties in that particular organizational form with the particular men who constitute, represent, and lead them are no longer recognized by their class as its expression. When such crises occur, the immediate situation becomes delicate and dangerous because the field is open for violent solutions, for the activities of unknown forces represented by charismatic men of destiny. He went on to write that the modern crisis, which is bemoaned as a wave of materialism, is related to what is called the crisis of authority. If the ruling class has lost its consensus, i.e. is no longer leading, but only dominant, exercising coercive force alone, this means precisely that the great masses have become detached from the traditional ideologies and no longer believe what they used to believe previously. The crisis consists precisely in the fact that the old is dying and the new cannot be born. In this interregnum, a great variety of morbid symptoms appear. And comrades, the symptoms are morbid. But let's look at Trump's supposed electoral victory. His voters came mainly from lower middle and privileged sections of the working class. He won 77% of votes who said they were worse off than four years prior. Trump won the white and male vote by decisive margins. Strongest support was rural voters. Protestants and Catholics favored him. 80% of evangelicals voted for him. He won the veteran vote. And if you exclude the states of California and New York, Trump would have won the popular vote by three million votes. A Gallup poll noted that in a study conducted by Richard F. Hamilton, who wrote, uh, who voted for Hitler, the NSPD enjoyed similar electoral support. One might think that the fascists are indeed in power, but we must consider the following. CNN observed that only 55% of citizens of the voting age cast ballots that year, the lowest percentage since 1996. In fact, the results follow in step with an overall trend in neoliberalism of lower voter turnout. But when one looks at the two parties of the United States, the political horizon they depict is largely the same. The only difference is the degree and the way uh, the concerns of people of color, immigrants, LGBTQ folk, and women can be expressed. At the scale of American congressional politics, deadlock and weak compromise have generally defined the terms of engagement. It should come as no surprise that in a two-party system like that of the United States, the feeling that one's vote carries effect, carries consequence, is severely lacking. 
So it wasn't that Trump won because his vision of a reactionary America was so popular, so much as Trump's victory rises out of the incapacity of the Democrats and the left beyond them to delineate an alternative vision for society, while Trump clearly has. That is, the Democrats had come to rule out of coercion alone, detached themselves entirely from the social bases they claimed to represent, and left the field open for insurgent voices. As much as it provides an opportunity for the radical right, it provides an historical opening for the radical left. Furthermore, when it comes to Trump in office, we should carefully observe just how incapable he is of effectively governing. The question as to whether or not Trump is a fascist in a classical sense is less significant, I feel, when we consider his own capacity to develop consequence. That is, when comparing Trump to Hitler, Trump lacks an analysis of the relations of force of state and civil society, and he lacks a party apparatus, the kind of countervailing force and power that Hitler wielded with the Nazi party and his armies of brown-shirted stormtroopers, from which he draws, drew his strength. Nonetheless, this is not to say that we cannot see such a formation struggling to be born, especially in the events surrounding Charlottesville, Virginia. As Hart and Negri observe in their latest book, Assembly, the Tea Party supporters, who prefigured Trump's base, should be considered not conventional conservatives, but reactionary conservatives, because in addition to their libertarian economic arguments, they seek to turn back the clock and restore an imagined national identity that is primarily white, Christian, and heterosexual. They demonize those they perceive to threaten the unity of the people, including the poor, migrants, welfare recipients, and Muslims, and believe that President Obama represents and even embodies all of them. He is, in effect, the Tea Party's antagonist in chief. Indeed, Hart and Negri go on to observe that today's right-wing movements are reactionary not only in that they seek to restore a past social order, but also in that they borrow, often in distorted form, the protest repertoires, vocabularies, and even stated goals of the left resistance and liberation movements but only to maintain or restore social hierarchies. This is evident in Trump's remarks about wanting to make the Republican Party the party of America's working class to the degree of visiting plants scheduled to be moved to Mexico and preventing their closure, only to reduce corporate taxes and allow the plant to expand automation. And the left beyond the Democrats? Herein lies the rub, dear comrades. The unpopular rise of Donald Trump to power combined with the inability of the Democrats to develop a political alternative to neoliberalism has helped push people to the streets in numbers unseen since the last great cycle of struggles of the 60s and 70s. His arrival to the White House was marked by black bloc burning cars in Washington, D.C. the night prior, to the Women's March the next day taking the streets uh, all that day, becoming the most popular uh, protest in U.S. history to airport occupations in the days after that, and the international women's strike a few short months later. Trump has marked great movement in the left. And simul simultaneous to this movement and in the lead up to it, we see the composition of new organs of struggle and the contestation of historic working class organizations. Among the many new and old things composing and recomposing are the Democratic Socialists of America, DSA, the Union Democracy Movement, and the feminist movement. Prior to the loss of the Democrats in the 2016 presidential election, the DSA had a scant 6,000 members. Formed in the early 1980s, the organization was for decades little more than a social democratic party that wanted something like Sweden for America. But now the organization has 30,000 members and is populated by Marxists of all stripes in a struggle to develop a new vehicle that can take society to a horizon still undefined. With DSA, an organizational opportunity has developed that is unique to the current conjuncture. This is why we've brought R.L. Stevens, who is a member of its National Political Committee, its Leadership Council, and Maga Miranda Alcazar, a member of DSA's Communist Refoundation Caucus. Besides his involvement in DSA, R.L. was a former A. Philip Randolph Fellow at Jacobin Magazine, um, and his writing has appeared in The Guardian, Gawker, and Viewpoint magazine. Beyond her work in DSA, Maga is also a member of the militant research collective known as Viewpoint, and has published a viral article in defense of the women's strike for the nation, 
and organized in New York City for the international women's strike. Her academic work focuses on immigra immigrant women workers, immigrant labor centers, and cooperatives and social reproduction theory. In the build-up to this conjuncture, and now in its midst, We've seen the growth of the union democracy movement, pushed by union grassroots members to democratize the structures of unions and broaden, the horizon, and broaden their horizon. Both Amanda Armstrong and Katie Fox Hodas have been at the center of this movement and were integral members of the Academic Workers for a Democratic Union, or ADU, caucus of the United Auto Workers that organized graduate student workers across the University of California. In an historic contract campaign in 2014, Amanda and Katie, alongside Audu comrades, were successfully able to secure all gender bathrooms and lactation stations for graduate student workers, thus turning LGBTQ issues and women's issues into workers' issues. Katie's academic work examines international solidarity among dock workers' unions in Europe and the Americas today through a global organizational ethnic ethnography of the International Dock Workers Council. Her work has been published in a number of magazines and journals, including Jacobin and Labor Notes. Amanda's written work has focused on Marx's mature writings, concepts of looting, trans politics and social reproduction, and contemporary university struggles. Since her involvement in ADU, Amanda helped organize the international women's strike, while Katie remains active in the BDS movement. They are both contributing editors at Viewpoint as well. We asked Emily Lacker, a German-American member of Interventionistische Linke, who has lived in the US and is now based in Hamburg, to help bridge the cultural divide that stands between us, given her familiarity with the United States. She became a prominent voice defending the actions of EL in the struggle against the G20. Emily has an extensive history and, and an organic relationship with left organizing in the German context. Antje Dietrich, who will moderate the event, has been involved politically in both the United States and Germany. In the US, she was involved with an anti-authoritarian cadre that supplemented student struggles, and in Germany, Antje has an extensive history in the refugee struggle and is a primary organizer at Solidarity City Berlin. Her work has been published in Jacobin Magazine, in Rohr Magazine, and a number of other publications. We selected these voices specifically because they are a portrait of the left that is at the margins of the popular imaginary, a departure from a world dominated by white industrial workers and the homogeneity with which socialism is often portrayed. Fundamentally, the speakers were chosen because they have articulated nuanced and sophisticated arguments uh, around questions of identity and class, politics, organizational forms and the question of leadership, as well as base building and the relationship with event politics in a time where the left is often haunted by new dogmas and old ghosts. I must add, they do not speak for any organization, but speak from them with all the unease and tension that collective struggle entails. Without further ado, I present to you our beloved guests and moderator. Thank you very much for the praise and the awesome introduction. That was uh, very nice. Um, and I would like to open up the panel with a very broad question um, informed by the headline. <laughs> there is this discourse that Trump is just crazy and now you have crazy in office and you just have to impeach him or get somewhat rid of him. So I would like to kind of start with this open question. Is he just crazy? Should we just get rid of him? <laughs> Maybe, Katie, you want to start? Can you talk about it quickly? Uh, he's crazy and we should get rid of him. <laughs> but that's not, um, that's not enough of a political analysis. Um, I think we have to think about what it is that, um, what kind of a society elects a person like this to lead, right? Um, and we, we, you know, we need to think about what are the reasons he was elected in the first place? We had so much um, sort of superficial analysis of the election at the time, you know, um, particularly uh, blaming um, exclusively working class voters, um, looking at um, and raising important issues, issues of 
racism, issues of misogyny that certainly um, were very uh, evident in the election, but that unfortunately are constants in the American political scene. Um, the United States is built on white supremacy and misogyny is, is a constant in the, in the culture. Um, and Trump has certainly activated those tendencies within the American public, but um, those explanations aren't sufficient to understand why he was elected. We can't, we can't explain change through factors that are constant. Right, um, so we have to look at um, you know what's changed in American society in the past ten years. The economic crisis, of course, um, but which is part of a, a much broader economic crisis for the working class, stretching back to the 1970s, where we have rising um, inequality since that time, consolidation um, of wealth. Uh, greater and greater uh, sense of precarity and insecurity, um, and and it's it's to these these sort of more long term uh, trends in the society that uh, with deeper um, that that I think have, provide a deeper explanation for um, both the outcome of the election, but also pointing in the direction of what we need to do now as socialists to organize in this context. I just want to say a little bit about, um, I suppose, some of the far-right forces that Trump's election has helped to sort of galvanize and authorize. Um, and sort of one stream within this formation refers to itself as the alt-right, which of course is a reference to a national socialist category um, of the alt-reich, the old, old empire, the people from the kind of or original Germany or whatever. <laughs> um, so there's clearly a kind of um, hearkening back to fascist uh, uh, categories within this force. Um, and I think one thing that's, that maybe is under uh, recognized about this force is, is the degree to which they are picking up on and in some ways trying to exercise the ghosts of, but also draw some force from recent um, social struggles on the left. So to some extent, this is a, is a matter of backlash politics, but there's something more complex going on that I think um, something Walter Benjamin said um, helps illuminate, which is that behind every fascism, there's a failed revolution. And in some ways, it's perhaps grandiose to compare recent social struggles in the United States to the 1918 and 1919 German Revolution. But I think that there is some way in which uh, we get a better appreciation of the politics of the alt-right or the emergence of the alt-right if we contextualize that, them in relation to recent social struggles, um, whether that be student struggles, um, the Occupy movement, um, anti-police brutality struggles, um, uh, the immigrant rights organizing in the United States. And one really illustrative incident of sort of what I'm trying to draw out about this relationship is when um, Milo Yiannopoulos came to California and really targeted the campuses where the student struggle was strongest in 2009 and 2011 with the Occupy movement. And his um, followers actually reenacted um, an incident of police violence at the University of California, Davis, where they um, acted like the police who had shot, who had sprayed pepper spray on students. Um, and so there's a certain way in which there is an attempt to exercise the um, kind of potentials that these movements brought out and I think still hold um, with them. It, there's also an attempt to exercise, as Daniel was saying, the, an earlier moment of struggle um, one of the people reenacting the pepper spray incident said, um, you know, die hippie scum or something like that. So there's a referencing back to the struggles of the 60s and 70s. Um, and, and I think that this is an animating feature of the alt-right. And it also, I think, is important for us to keep this in mind as leftists, um, that there is a, they sort of recognize a threat from us that I think we would do well to make real. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Um, I just wanted to add add something briefly. Um, one thing I, I, I one point I really want to drive home about Trump's election is that um, I think it's really important that we not see it as an inevitability. I think it's very easy to look at um, recent um, historical events and think that's the only way that things could have turned out under the circumstances. And I think if we look back. Um, to the election campaign, what was so remarkable about it wasn't just that we have this person, Trump, who's never held office before, who's a wealthy person, um, you know, sort of media uh, figure taking office, but the other really remarkable thing in the election was that we had this sort of self-proclaimed socialist, Bernie Sanders, certainly, um, you know, uh, the furthest left senator sitting in the US Senate, um, coming very close to becoming the, the Democratic candidate um, in the election. And the fact that he didn't become the Democratic candidate is down to the uh, incredible dysfunction and undemocratic nature of the Democratic Party. But that's not an inevitability. And I think um, at fundamentally, this election showed how disenchanted an enormous swath of the U.S. Uh, vote, uh, uh, electorate is with the, with the system. Um, and, and that disenchantment is a disenchantment with the government, it's a, a disenchantment um, with the economy, it's a disenchantment with both political parties. And so what we saw on both sides was voters looking for alternatives outside of the mainstream. And we saw populism of the right and populism of, of the left. So, um, so I, I think that that's an important hopeful note to, to, um, to kind of hold on to, this sense that this wasn't inevitable and that the, the basic underlying conditions in the society that led to Trump's election, if they had been handled or um, uh, oriented more skillfully by the left, could in fact have led in a very different direction. And I still think that that's possible. Uh, so, my organization obviously benefited greatly from uh, Trump's election and the Bernie Sanders insurgency within the Democratic Party and the, the issues in this electoral um, uh, contestation. However, I'd like to, to, to caution or, or add a different kind of uh, point of analysis to this. So, I think... Um, one thing to keep in mind is that the Republican Party is, is a conservative party, right? But it wasn't always. And there has been a conservative movement in the United States that goes back decades that worked like at all levels of the party and at multiple levels of the state to build coalitions and to build an orthodoxy around uh, conservatism. And they started with Barry Goldwater, and they, this is decades long, right, where they took over the party. And they got to the point where the Republican Party has uh, over half of the states in the United States are under complete Republican control. That means both houses of, of um, the legislature as well as the governorship are controlled by the Republican Party. And so I believe that there are like 27, something like that, trifectas in um, various states in the United States. Whereas the Democratic Party which has by design like abandoned that kind of um, political work, building a party from the ground up at, at multiple levels of the state. Um, they have, I believe it's five trifectas, okay? Um, and so it just goes to show that the institutional weight of the Republican Party, it's not like by accident that they're uh, winning elections across the country and, and, and Trump is able to be a, an un, largely unpopular figure, but has that coalition, has that party behind him able to like drag him across the line because Hillary Clinton ran such a terrible campaign and the Democratic Party sabotaged Bernie Sanders' candidacy in order to um, prevent uh, uh, him being able to contest in, in, in the general election. And so I think like there's a dual, there's a dual front to it where the the nature of the Republican Party is so well organized for, and has been for decades, 
we're talking about the moral majority, which was a bunch of like evangelical Christians that became like the backbone of the party. We're talking about um, when segregationists left the Democratic Party and went to the Republican Party and were like, states' rights and get these black people out of our schools. You know, this is, there are decades of work building the consensus that we identify as Trumpism um, that is embedded into the institutional framework of US politics through the Republican Party. So I think like, maybe that doesn't mean that it's inevitable, but I would say that it's already here. Like it, and it has been here, it's been designed for a long time. And so the last piece that I'll add to that though is that even that consensus and that orthodoxy and those coalitions are under tremendous stress. That's why Trump, like became the nominee. Trump got up on stage during the Republican uh, uh, primaries and this brother was just freestyling up there. Like he was not saying, he freestyled his way to the, to the nomination. And um, he just was going up there just saying any old thing, you know? And that really reflects the crisis of all of that work that the Republican Party had done, they still had the foundation for it, but it's under strain. Just like Bernie Sanders got up there and spit some real stuff, and then that exposed the Democratic Party's coalitions and orthodoxy as being under strain. And it's just that Trump was able to win in that process and Bernie Sanders was not. And so I think like what we have right now is bigger than just this election or just tr Trump or even the electoral realm itself. What we have is a crisis of governance both in the United States and globally. Like the, the US government, I haven't been watching the news because I, I haven't been like on the internet, but I think the government shut down, right? Yeah, uh, the US government is shut down right now. And the response to that, like, I'm not in a panic, right? But tell you what, if Facebook shuts down, I'll be like, what is going on? You know, and a lot of people would be like that because where does the governance of society truly reside? How, does, how is society being reproduced and what, where does the politics reside? Is it actually in, um, in, the, uh, in these grand events of electoral politics and how, what's the relationship between that? I think that's a question that we would need to ask and I think the, the Trump election and, your, and there are other figures like Berlusconi in Italy and all, all kinds of um, fascistic figures that are telling, signaling to us that there's a crisis of governance and I think uh, we're looking at this Oprah candidacy potentially that shows that like the state itself has so much weight and so much institutional uh, uh, constraints on it by capitalism that maybe it doesn't matter who's running, what the candidate stands for because all of that gets stripped out around like the inertia of how the, um, how the institutions and the structures are set up. And so maybe governance resides somewhere else. Maybe politics is somewhere else. And that to me gives me uh, hope for revolution. I'd like to just quickly add something. Um, returning to the question of, is Donald Trump crazy? Um, I'm not gonna entertain that question because I think it's kind of actually ableist. Like, he just has very bad politics. Um, but, but my, I think a better question might be like, what is that sort of discourse doing politically? Um, you know, you'll, if you watch enough mainstream media in the US and probably abroad, you'll hear like sort of the spectacle that is Donald Trump. Um, you know, and then, and it, it serves as this, like this really interesting, a couple of functions, but like the first thing is, for example, you hear Donald Trump tweeted that he wants to go to war with North, North Korea and it allows, it gives permission for the Democratic Party to then say, well, we, we wouldn't tweet about it, but like, it, and then sort of like exaggerates the difference um, actually politically because one gets to be like the crazy spectacle and the other one is sort of like diplomatic and socially acceptable. And, um, and that kind of speaks to um, what I wanna say about the, the discourse, which is that it sort of has diverted attention or, or exaggerated like the big difference between the two bourgeois parties um, that I think Daniel did a really good job of ar articulating. And one of the things, one of the examples, ways that I understand this example um, is that Donald Trump's deportation machine, for example, his entire, um, a lot of his platform was based on sort of xenophobia, especially against Mexican immigrants. Um, and we're, I'm, I've been keeping up with it since the election. There is, in fact, a sort of 35 to 37% increase in deportations, uh, at least within the first couple of months. 
um, from the Obama administration, which is sort of incredible considering that Obama was notoriously the you know um, largest deporter of the president who's deported more more migrants um, than any other president. And so like I think that there's a, a need to sort of understand that 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 the Trump is crazy discourse is doing this thing of trying to like exaggerate the difference and we need to still hold accountable um, all of these bourgeois parties whether um, there is a real difference uh, obviously my argument is not that there isn't a real difference between sort of Trumpism and neoliberalism because we've seen sort of like the the real violence that comes along with like the rise of the alt-right that they feel permission but at the end of the day um, we have to understand that the infrastructures that have allowed Trump to do that were sort of already in place with the previous administration. You know, um, Donald Trump has explicitly used the databases of immigrants to keep track of um, criminal elements that sort of started under Obama um, that like now sort of include like, including like a couple of babies are on these like criminal databases. Um, and it's, it's a very scary thing, but I think it's important to like also note that. Thank you very much. Um, I think what became clear is that it's obviously not a problem about a person, so this is why the question was <laughs> asked like that. Um, but what all of you kind of pointed out is that it's structural and uh, different points, you said the left wasn't really skillful or um, didn't really capture what the conflicts were and so I would like to kind of go a little bit to the theoretical <laughs> or half practical uh, part of our debate um, and the question on identity and class and this idea that they're played against each other and identity politics became kind of like a signifier of, oh, that's the typical left that can't talk to people and that's like um, not actually uh, visionary or not actually transformative. And we, I found this quote from you, Amanda, <laughs> where you said the early 70s were characterized by overlapping state efforts to neutralize and co-opt anti-racist and feminist project of self-determination. Um, these were state offensives that helped found a neoliberal era of governance for analysts to reduce radical race gender politics to identity politics and then associate the latter with neoliberalism is to fundamentally misperceive the last 50 years of history. So what you basically claim is that it's not identity politics, it's a transformation, a co-optation of identity politics. Can you maybe explain a bit how that actually happened? Like what was the breaking point or, yeah? I'd be happy to, yeah. Um, so just to maybe start with an example from the universities. In the, 1960, the late 1960s and early 1970s, there were... Um, mass strikes in the universities and beyond the universities um, in, at UC Berkeley and um, San Francisco State University. There were uh, strikes referred to as the Third World Liberation Front strikes. Um, and one of the aims of these strikes was the establishment of um, a Third World College. So essentially a semi-autonomous, um, anti-racist, um, anti-colonial, uh, educational space within these public institutions and the strikes the strike in at Berkeley was successful only after Oakland municipal employees threatened to strike and the governor the mayor of Oakland basically called the, cha the chancellor of Berkeley and said you need to end this strike because we can't have the trash piling up in Oakland and so with these limited concessions, we saw the establishment of essentially black studies and ethnic studies programs. Uh, a few years later, there were um, occupations to uh, establish women's studies programs. So you have the establishment of um, uh, programs within the universities that are in some conversation with radical social movements of the late 1960s and early 70s. But what's very interesting that um, a comrade named Nick Mitchell uh, um, has actually analyzed is that in these, prog these programs, and this was because of the resistance of the 
predominantly white male um, faculty in the universities. The programs were underfunded and uh, were forced to use contingent faculty labor. And so it's a very interesting story where um, what has become the dominant form of university labor, this kind of precarious academic labor, was um, tested out um, as a result of uh, racist and sexist backlash politics within the university. So I think that's a very clear example of how you have a kind of partial co-optation and partial uh, resistance against the radical um, feminist and anti-racist movements of the 60s and 70s that in some ways sets the terms that would become generalized into kind of neoliberal politics. And just to say something a little bit more general about those social movements, um, in the late 1960s and early 70s, feminist and anti-racist movements were experimenting with practices of insurgent, uh, uh, autonomous social reproduction. So the free breakfast programs that the Black Panther Party established, the free medical programs, um, the Jane Abortion Collective in which women um, learned how to perform abortions unlawfully um, and kind of generalized that knowledge. And there's a very interesting sequence by which those movements were repressed and also partially co-opted and neutralized. And, and the process by which abortion was legalized is a really interesting example of that, where um, the Jane Collective was raided, their tools were taken away, and uh, at the same time, the Supreme Court passed Roe versus Wade, the legalization of abortion. Um, and, but what's interesting is that in legalizing abortion, they didn't say women have a right to abortion. They said the state can't restrict doctors from performing abortion. And so they actually reestablished the authority of the doctor and the patient-doctor relationship and took away the power that women had been establishing for themselves to perform abortions. And the uh, negotiation with the police around the raid of Jane resulted in the collective giving up their, tool, their tools, basically. So here's a very clear example of a kind of neutralization and co-optation um, of an autonomous um, process of social reproduction. And I think that um, it is important for us to reanimate the legacy of these radical movements to show that there is a kind of confrontation with um, the uh, gendered and racial dimensions of capitalism um, and the kind of hierarchies that are um, built into capitalist society and reproductive of capitalist relations um, so that class politics and so-called identity politics or maybe a politics of, of race and gender are it's necessary for them to be articulated together. They are not going to be successful if they're not articulated together. And I think the, this older history is very important for us to kind of return to. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ariel, um, I read somewhere that you are, and um, you used the word hostile to a theoretical body that is surrounding these identity politics, so-called identity politics. Um, uh, hostile to intersectionality and critical race theory, and you described that as something that also happened after you, and I quote, stepped up your Marxism. <laughs> um, do you disagree with Amanda's analysis, or do you maybe not believe that that we can address uh, this kind of like multifaceted uh, mobilization successfully? Or uh, I think. Uh well, I, I like bringing up the example of uh, how ethnic studies programs were created in, in the university sphere. Because on the one hand, as you're saying, uh, there's a precarity to the labor that's used due to underfunding. On the other hand, 
the, the Ford Foundation actually came in as a meaningful partner in expanding and establish, well, establishing these programs. And so what happened was there were these radical movements that were articulating a new vision of society in which there were um, emancipation of oppressed people and the liberation of all people was a core element of the political work that was happening in New York and all kinds of places. So then the Ford Foundation comes in and uh, they strip that vision, that revisioning of society out and silo it into um, an, uh, an identity formation that has an entitlement to the university under the auspice of I am black and therefore I want to study myself. And then all of the idea of like, well actually the university is a space for the transformation of all peoples and we're going to use the, the, the liberation or emancipation of black people as a site for um, inquiry and activity on that total social liberation front, Ford Foundation was like, nope, <laughs> y'all can't do that. So instead of it being this radical student-centered program, it gets changed into a professor and administrator-centered program, black studies I'm talking about. Um, the, the content of the programs changed. The way that it's conducted changes, and, and, um, and it totally gets attached to the status quo while also articulating the identity element of it as being like primary rather than the contradictions of society and uh, being the primary issue. So I think like that's like where, what, what I'm attempting to talk about in, when I say that like intersectionality as a concept, which I graduated from law school, so I learned about it. It's, um, it, it's really rooted um, in uh, Title IX anti-discrimination law with regards to employment and so, the assumptions underpinning it are that the, uh, like for example, you have to be a member of a protected class. This is what the law says. Like in order to make a discrimination claim, you have to be a member of a, of a protected class. And so that protected class is defined by what the law calls an immutable characteristic. So race is, un your race is a protected class and it's, and it's immutable, meaning it doesn't change. And I'm like, what the hell? Uh, <laughs> that is not true. Um, like how, who gets determined to be black changes over space and time. Who gender, all of these things are fluid, contingent, shifting, right? So the assumption of the law saying that there are these discrete categories that are just like they are what they are and um, they're trans-historical and they're unchanging, that is just false on its, on its face. So then intersectionality comes in to play within that domain of both the, uh, a rigid construction of, of identity as well as like an entitlement regime which uh, is arguing over jobs and the, basically the, 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 the allocation of resources under the status quo. And so for me, like there's no emancipatory or liberatory element in the, in the theory. It's not actually dissolving the divisions insofar as it's arguing for how social resources are allocated to those two people within those divisions, which is important, don't get me wrong, like anti-discrimination stuff is significant under our current conditions, but it's not what it takes to be transformative to liquidate the divisions themselves and emancipate the people. And as someone concerned with revolution, that's what I care about. And so um, the last thing I'll say about it is that's not to say that um, issues of identity and um, the, what I would, instead of identity, I would call it the particularities of oppression, the specificity of oppression. That doesn't mean that those things are irrelevant. Um, but instead of reifying or, or fetishizing those particularities as if they are trans-historical, as if they are uh, discrete, as if they are unchanging, which I believe things like Afro-pessimism do, uh, which is a, a, an offshoot of critical race theory. Um, we need to be thinking of transformative uh, uh, um, articulations of politics that have a revolutionary character, that have the overt and stated mission of dissolving um, the, the particularities of this oppression through universal struggles like for emancipation. It's the unity of the particularity and the universal, that ontological, um, unity that is the, es the essential character of revolutionary socialism, I believe. And so um, when a politics does that, which as we were talking about in the 60s when you have revolutionary movements on the ground trying to articulate that type of vision, taking seriously black liberation, like, and saying that black liberation is not simply for black people, 
but it is a, a component for the universal emancipation of all peoples. Um, I think like we need that kind of visioning, bold visioning of a new society that has this emancipatory uh, relationship to the particularities while also articulating a, a broad vision that is totally different than the status quo. And I don't know if, um, if the way that we pit identity politics and all of this actually hits on those, the contradictions that underline that and that um, produce a politics that can accomplish it. And instead, what we have is people who say identity politics are bad are actually just advocating for like a working class identity politics, which to me is really bad. <laughs> so uh, it's actually worse than, um, but, but, uh, but we need to break the brokerage model of like these interest groups and all of that and start articulating a bolder, more collective vision that does not erase the particularities. I think Katie, you are on your chair. <laughs> Yeah, um, so I just wanted to um, kind of make very concrete for you all what the stakes of these debates are in the United States because I, I'm not sure how well um, this, this maps on to the German context. In, in the US left, what we have now are debates which pit a sort of workerist, economistic view of, of socialism against a view of socialism that um, is concerned with issues of uh, race and gender in particular. And the way th these debates tend to play out, um, I think from the side of the kind of economistic, workerist um, socialism, uh, they tend to, to sort of mischaracterize the working class in the United States in a number of ways that are quite significant. So first of all, um, their image of the working class continues to be a white male worker. And in fact, in the United States today, white men are a minority of the working class. So um, people of color and or women together make up a majority of the working class today. That's, that's just a fact. That's not a, um, that's not a debating point, right? The second way that the working class um, is mischaracterized, I, I would argue, um, is that there's a, a, a kind of reified and very stereotypical view of um, working class white men, actually, which personally I find um, very condescending and, um, and, and, yeah, quite patronizing, actually. This is a view of working class uh, white men as um, a monolithic group of reactionary, race, racist, misogynists. And um, of course, there is a tremendous amount of racism and misogyny in every strata of American society. Um, but this isn't, the, um, this isn't a monolithic uh, quality of working class white men. And, um, and even if it were, the, um, the, the kind of view of this, the, 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 that this side of the debate would have is that if, if the working class is sort of racist and sexist, we shouldn't do anything to push them. We should meet them where they're at and only talk about safe issues that don't touch on these controversial topics of racism and sexism. So even if that was true, I mean, that's, that's such a, a patronizing perspective to have as though people aren't able to take in new information, aren't able to debate, aren't able to, to have a conversation, to evolve in their positions. So I think from a number of perspectives, this is, this is wrong, right? And I think what it really points to, and I think that um, this is a perspective that we have put forward as Viewpoint Magazine, um, I think in the writing that we publish both on race and on gender, where we argue that fundamentally, capitalism is a totality. And white supremacy and patriarchy are part of that totality. They're not separate structures existing outside of capitalism. They compose capitalism. Capitalism as we know it would not exist without white supremacy and, and patriarchy. And so in any given historical moment, um, you know, the leading edge of class struggle might be an anti-racist struggle. It might be um, a, a feminist struggle. These aren't separate from class struggle. They're, they are part of the class struggle. And there is no world in which we can imagine um, overturning capitalism without overturning white supremacy and patriarchy. So I think it's this unified perspective we're putting forward, getting rid of this dichotomy between 
um, economism, which really means white men, working class on the one hand and women and people of color on the other. We want to get rid of this dichotomy and say, no, this is all part of the same thing. Um, and, and this is the fight that we need to, to make together. Thank you very much. I would love to hear a little bit more about the practical implication, but maybe that is a moment for Emily to kind of have a bridge because I do feel that particularly that imagined division between the worker and other oppressed people or something like that, like this weird other group, is something that, that uh, moves us here in different currents. Mm -hmm. So what's your question? If you would like to answer the question from Katie, like how do you see that reflected here in Germany as like in difference or in parallel to the US? So I guess when we speak about identity politics in Germany, um, I guess it's important to bring in a German perspective that is quite different historically from the US. So whiteness is obviously constructed differently in Germany. Um, there's a question of, I think even today in German society, a German is seen as white and uh, we see, people are discussing it in terms of foreigners and Germans, whites and others. And uh, I mean, it's also obviously still a big problem of anti-Semitism in Germany. And there's also another category that I guess is kind of similar to how racism works, but doesn't play upon the color of people's skin, which is oppression of people from Eastern Europe. So obviously they're white, but they're still discriminated in a way that's very similar to, to racism uh, in Germany. And um, I guess a problem that's somewhat similar and somewhat connected is the issue of how academic the left is. And so the problem is if, I'm a, I'm a college dropout, right? But I'm one of very few college dropouts in uh, my community within my comrades. And so if you mainly recruit your members and, and your comrades from other people in academia, um, then they're quite likely to mainly be white and to not have a background in, in migration. Um, I think in Berlin we've had some experience and we've had some, uh, some efforts to try to integrate this and to become less white. I think an interventionist left IL in Berlin um, has especially had some very interesting efforts to integrate refugees that recently or uh, further back um, came to Berlin and to include them in or have them be active members like, like Germans are as well in IL. And I also, I guess in terms of why we are so white, um, I guess there are also reasons I can understand why people would want to organize with other people with the same background. For example, we've been working closely with people in the Kurdish movement uh, where I totally understand that they'd want to organize with other Kurds for their movement and then the question is how do you become strong allies and, and develop friendships among each other and support each other's struggles. Um, I guess there's a lot that we could learn in Germany from debates in the US about how to have movements that are more inclusive uh, of all kinds of backgrounds. Uh, and I think there's also a lot to be learned from what not to do in terms of how Hillary Clinton had her uh, presidential campaign, which is, uh, which was one that was a lot of, um, which drew on identity politics in a hollow way, in an empty way, in the sense of, of neoliberalism. And um, so the thing is, in Germany, we've had a chancellor, a female chancellor for the past 12 years, and she's conservative, so where's that brought us? And women's liberation has never been about just putting a woman in the White House, but about bringing down the house of male oppression, of, of male dominance over women's bodies. And uh, I guess in a way, when you look at the Trump campaign, um, I guess the way we've been discussing it or trying to understand it from here is that it was a backlash on, uh, on white men who were afraid that their rights that they never deserved their dominance that they never deserve was going to be taken away. But it also drew upon a really real uh, sense of, um, of crisis, of material crisis. So that was really real, real in that the Democratic Party failed to, to address. And then, I mean, thirdly, and RL spoke about this, the emptiness of, and the crisis of governance that we've seen in Germany as well. I mean, I don't know if you've, uh, if you've followed the news, but the German government has been unable to uh, find a new government after the last election. 
And the last election was also a historic win for the AfD, the ultra-right in Germany, which has so far never happened in the same uh, amount that uh, they won the election. And so I guess um, that really reminded me on, of um, what, uh, what Daniel said in the beginning when he quoted Gramsci. And I think he, he didn't say the part about it's the time of monsters. It's the time of when there's, when there's emptiness, when people stop believing in capitalism, when people are not uh, excited and passionate about, uh, about Hillary Clinton. Then that's the time of the rise of the monsters of Trump and the AfD. Um, and so I guess... I really liked, it, Katie, what you said about uh, how we can't pit identity politics against class politics. And I, I appreciated how I think we kind of all argued in the same direction. I'd be very curious to see if that's the way it's being discussed in the US, because in Germany and in the German left, there's quite a, uh, a debate about the same, the same question. And there are, um, there's Sarah Wagenknecht, which is, a, is the leader in the Socialist Party, who very strongly argues in the sense of workers are white and we need to address their needs and their feelings. And so I guess if you'd ask me, is it a question of identity politics or is it a question of class politics or economic injustice under capitalism, then it's neither because it's both. Uh, as I understand it, it, there's a sort of practical question to like sort of wrapped up in here, like how do you do um, this and I, I don't know that I can answer that um, in a like sort of this is the way to do it um, but I can speak to um, some of my experience uh, organizing with the international women's strike um, I'm I want to sort of push back on the way that we're using the term working class first of all though and sort of like lay out what I think is like a in my <laughs> view like a sort of expansive idea of the working class um, I think for Marx, the working class was the uh, population that is dispossessed of the means of subsistence and has to sell their labor power. Didn't say, like, needs to be this person that, you know, works a 40-hour work week and looks like, um, you know, wears a hard hat and, and all this stuff. So I, there's a lot of sort of um, tradition within this, like, socialist tradition that I think that we need to sort of critically um, interrogate and revisit and... Um, and sort of expand our conception of what capitalism is, uh, starting from sort of Marx's own articulation. I really like to sort of um, bring it back to this uh, map that the geographer um, David Harvey has sort of put together, like a map of capital, because I think this is like sort of gets to the fundamental question about um, what does it mean to do like anti-capitalist work and what is the sort of um, strategic entry point for doing anti-capitalist work. And so in his map, he sort of like does focus a lot on the sort of point of production struggles, which are sort of, um, we take for granted as like being the entry point of socialist politics. Um, but also talks about like the circuit, uh, the circulation, right? And, uh, and for me as a Marxist feminist, I really, I think there's a lot of really fantastic work being done in, um, what's called what's been called social reproduction theory which is sort of that that sphere of everything that happens from when the worker receives a wage um, to when they return back to work the next day like this is also for social reproduction theorists an important sort of site of political struggle um, of potentially anti-capitalist struggle and this gets gendered because of uh, exactly the way that Amanda and Katie and, and others were describing that you know, chauvinism, racism, um, gendered spheres of production are sort of integral to how capital functions on a day to day. They're not sort of like just liberation struggles. Like they are actually, you know, the traditionally the wage is a sort of androcentric concept and sort of like the sphere of social reproduction gets gendered as um, feminine. And so, you know, I, I think that there's a way to say like, the feminist struggle against the sort of um, gendered sphere of social reproduction is an anti-capitalist, can be an anti-capitalist struggle, um, not that they're sort of separate. And so that's sort of my entry point, that I think that there are a lot of various entry points to disrupting capital at the point of sort of circulation, production, social reproduction, et cetera, and, and we need to sort of think creatively about um, those, those sort of sites where we can disrupt and, and sort of strategically about that too, I'm, I'm very interested in thinking about um, strategic chokeholds for social reproduction and I think this is something that came up in my experience with the international women's strike um, organizing last year. We were sort of like, what does it mean to do 
to organize a women's strike and to also have it be anti-capitalist. And, and what happened was that we organized around this banner of uh, feminism for the 99%. And so you had like a, a bunch of people that were um, attracted to this message, um, sort of in, in traditional and non-traditional um, areas. So we had sort of what we would call um, a tra traditional labor union, so the nurses union in, in New York City participated. Um, the AFT, the American Federation of Teachers at the CUNY campuses in New York City were very active um, in organizing the actual day to day. And then you had sort of like, because of the banner that we sort of organized under, we also attracted certain kinds of um, n workers that are organized in non-traditional um, labor unions, uh, such as the retail workers and a number of people from um, this sex shop in New York City called Babeland that were sort of in the process of their contract negotiation, but they're not like an official union, so like don't have collective bargaining rights and like some, there, we also supported this campaign of um, servers at a restaurant that were mostly women and, and also attracted a, a whole broad swath of sort of um, what was called the Pussy Hat Nation, which were sort of people who were uh, mobilized around like anger about the very vulgar misogynistic comments of um, the Trump campaign and something interesting really happened too because we weren't calling for a we called a strike but we weren't expecting sort of like a shutdown of a lot of um, workplaces but like somehow the word started to spread and um, next thing you knew there were like three um, three school districts that shut down and one, the courthouse in Providence, Rhode Island shut down, all from like word of mouth sort of organizing, people calling, um, calling in sick. So I think uh, the only the way that we sort of could have conceived of that w was by sort of thinking through like the, um, the questions of, like getting outside of the box of sort of traditional socialist organizing. Um, and, and I think, you know, the question of like chauvinism and not so much racism, but like privilege politics, like how, what does it mean to organize um, uh, women when there are like a number of women that are sort of in more privileged positions than others is like a question that we're still sort of thinking through. But one of the very clear conclusions was like we support and show solidarity with the most exploited and we don't, we don't sort of preemptively assume that they don't have any agency because, you know, for example, domestic workers are some of the most super exploited um, workers. We said, you know, if you can't um, walk off of work, then wear red um, and sort of, you know, had to think creatively about that. Thank you very much. I would actually maybe just go to that part which, um, yeah, um, goes around union organizing and um, reaching out to people something that uh, we struggle with also in the left in Germany, I would say. So, under maybe the banner of base building to, to get to the question um, how to step out of the bubble we, we kind of organize in amongst radicals and then uh, talk to real people. So, um, you all have different experiences but um, as Maga already said right now, you organized a sphere with women of reproductive um, labor that is not reachable through traditional uh, labor organizing because people are potentially not paid. Um, the people that are affected if they walk out are not the people they want to hit. So they don't hit the boss, they, they hit the person they... they Take care for, for example, all these elements make it very hard to, to organize. So you gave us an insight that you were looking for alternatives to wear red, for example. Um, does anyone else in the group have an experience with addressing, maybe like either through unions, addressing reproductive questions beyond the actual workplace or going from the other side like MAGA did and actually addressing people as uh, that are workers but are also just outside of work human beings. <laughs> I, 
absolutely. Um, just very quickly to add, I think um, there still are these like very practical questions about who you organize and who can be organized, absolutely, and, and where it's strategic to sort of organize. Those questions don't go away um, just because we're thinking non-traditionally. But I think um, one of the conversations I had with a EL comrade uh, last night was about like what are those sort of strategic um, choke points for social reproduction? Um, and one of the ways, places that we saw where like sort of union organizing took like a very sort of social reproduction turn was with, has been with the nurses unions. And I think that uh, the comrades in Germany were also explaining that, that you have the same situation here where sort of, you know, I think traditionally you think about like union organizing around bread and butter issues. Um, and then, and sort of this thing has happened where there's a social reproduction sort of strike element to it where nur like one of the main concerns for nurses in, in the US has been um, staff patient ratios. So it's not sort of like around wages or healthcare, but, but specifically about their ability to care for this patient. So it becomes this issue of like, um, that also involves the patient themselves. So like, um, they're saying, you know, there are too, too few of us to sort of properly care for as many, however many workers that we have. And, and then you start to open up this very interesting conversation about um, where does union organizing sort of end and bargaining sort of affect the worker themselves and where does sort of bargaining uh, affect also the people who receive these services. And I think that what the comrades were saying was very inspiring about um, the struggle in, um, with the nurses in Germany as well that, um, you know, then the nurses themselves started to like do a sort of inquiry project of like what do our patients care about? Like, and how do we sort of develop strategic campaigns um, as um, workers that are involved and center the experiences of the patients that we care for because at the end of the day to think about sort of the working classes like just the nurses or and the people who are receiving the, pa the care as just the recipient sort of misses the totality of it and this is a wonderful opportunity and I would, I would say like a strategic choke, choke hold of social reproduction. I think um, sort of in line with that, uh, in the sphere of education, you have a similar dynamic. Um, and uh, I was involved in 2013 and 2014 in contract negotiations with the Graduate Student Worker Union in California. Um, and we were really interested in broadening the terrain of negotiations beyond simply wages and benefits. And one of the ways that we did that was to um, push to negotiate over the question of class sizes, which is a very similar kind of situation um, to the uh, nurse-patient ratio question, in that it's a question of our workload, but it's also a question of the quality of the education that undergraduate students receive. Um, and it's a mechanism by which coalitions between graduate student workers and undergraduate students can be established. Um, we we're also interested not just in remaining within the sort of sphere of student life, um, but actually understanding that universities are some of the biggest employers of people from all different sectors um, in the US at the moment, hospitals are the other. Um, and so we were very interested in um, establishing relations of solidarity with service workers at the university and actually carried out a strike in sympathy with um, service workers who were on strike during the time of our contract campaign. So we were interested in trying to expand possibilities around striking in the United States where the labor law is very restrictive and possibilities for sympathy strikes are narrow and so we were interested in kind of pushing open that possibility and giving some experience um, in that sort of strike, which I think is a very, is necessary in order to kind of revitalize a uh, radical kind of labor movement in the US. And then finally, we were interested in thinking very carefully about um, articulating the interests of relatively privileged graduate student workers um, with uh, multiply oppressed student workers. And we did that by uh, sort of, this is a funny word, but empowering a committee within the union that we refer to as the Anti-Oppression Committee to lead campaigns on a number of different issues, including rights for student, uh, for undocumented graduate students, um, 
uh, rights to access to all gender bathrooms, especially for transgender students, um, issues affecting student parents like childcare and leaves, um, and also lactation stations. And these, this campaign, these issues, um, and, and this committee were some of, the, some of the areas in the contract campaign that had the most uh, kind of engagement by everyday graduate student workers. They were sort of the most vital um, areas of organizing in the campaign. And the management tried to pit the majority of graduate students against the union on, by saying, they're concerned with these marginal issues. Who really cares about all gender bathrooms? And what was amazing was that the, you know, the mass of the, of the graduate student workers said, oh, you think you're gonna try to appeal to our transphobia? Like, we're gonna be much more active and we're gonna actually come out in stronger numbers to oppose um, the university management. So it's actually a very inspiring moment of kind of recomposition of solidarities and identities and we were able to sort of break through on these various issues in negotiations and also to win a very strong contract with respect to wages and benefits. So it sort of showed that you could articulate these um, different uh, concerns. <laughs> so, um, so I just wanted to give an example from my research. So. My, my research is on um, a very traditional sector of the working class, um, dock workers, which is, I think it's Havenarbeiter, is that right? Uh, Havenarbeiter, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so a very tradi you know, a traditional sector of the working class, mostly men. Um, I've done research in uh, 40 cities and 20 countries, studying an international organization and the coordination of international solidarity. So I've had an opportunity to meet with activists from um, a lot of different contexts. and. The, I think the union I've been most impressed with is um, a very resource poor union in the south of Chile in a city called Talcahuano. And um, I think this union is so interesting for this discussion we're having right now because um, what this union has done is essentially found ways to bridge um, you know, building power at the point of production, the kind of you know, traditional thing that working class people are supposed to do to build strength, and these sort of social reproduction struggles that Maga and Amanda are talking about. So their union is, um, uh, it's really the center of their community, and it really functions as a community space. Um, it's sort of open every day, it's, uh, people are coming in and out, they have a, a wide range outside of the kind of direct functions of the union. They have a wide range of activities taking place from um, Alcoholics Anonymous meetings to um, after school programs for the um, you know, children in their community, very poor and working class children. Um, one of the days I was there doing interviews, there were a couple little girls there having a karate lesson, um, which was very sweet. And um, the union itself, which is all men, has worked very closely um, with the teachers' union in the community, um, mostly women. Um, and they say, you know, um, this is our children's education, right? So they're recognizing the role of um, education and social reproduction. They stopped work. They shut down the port to support the teachers' strike. Um, they've worked very closely with university students. There's a beautiful mural um, covering their, their union hall that was painted by university students. Um, and the city, you may have heard the name, there was um, a terrible earthquake in Chile in 2010, and a tsunami hit this city, Talcahuano, and um, a big portion of the city was destroyed. And the union really was the site of um, rebuilding. The union hall was where they had a soup kitchen, where they helped people organize to rebuild their homes, to um, petition the government for assistance. So I think that this, this example of you know, a very poor union in a peripheral location um, it really has a lot of lessons for how we can bridge these things that very often seem unbridgeable, but you know, somehow people are finding ways to do this, so I think we can too. Yeah. And oh, speaking of social reproduction, if anyone could get me like a cup of hot water, I would be so yeah. grateful because <laughs> my voice is dying. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so yeah, we had like that's these examples where basically from the workplace it reaches out into 
uh, like beyond workplace questions, which I think are actually awesome examples. Um, the March is a bit of another example. I would like to come back to that afterwards. But the DSA is an example where mobilization, I feel, that took place also through the Democratic Party and then was very disappointed, kind of was able to capture a certain dynamic there where people went to like suddenly said, okay, there are actually more than two parties in this country, so maybe we try something else. So, RL, that's obviously a question for you. Um, do you have the feeling that this, like, energy, that the DSA is a good vehicle to, to channel the energy of frustration around the Sanders campaign into actual political transformation? Because I think that is always the, the breaking point if you have like, and that is also, yeah, with Trump, for example, like something very mobilizing, a lot of people march, a lot of people get angry, but what do we do as like a left force to, to actually lead that into something new and better? Yeah, that's, uh, that's the big question. Um, <clears throat> uh, I, think, I think fundamentally it's a question of political leadership and whether we as political actors take that seriously. So when we say the term political or the phrase political leadership, what people often mean is like authority or like it's, it's vested in an individual, like I'm voted for this national political committee and therefore I am a political leader and what... But I think we need to trouble that understanding and understand political leadership as an orientation to a horizon. Um, and like, that's why I think it's very important to understand it as a social force and to understand uh, it as an articulation of a, of a bold vision for a new society and a, and a new peoplehood, a new solidarity, and not necessarily um, this kind of entitlement or, or interest groups or like limiting kind of um, narrow understandings of what politics are. And instead we've got to really be serious about um, transforming the society and having that be part of the vision. And I think uh, that's a struggle that we're having in DSA um, and just in politics generally is will we have the audacity, will we have the boldness, will we have the actual courage to uh, uh, lay, lay, down the, lay, lay a line down with the people. I think um, you all in Germany, like historically, were asking this question too. Like that's why, that's why Kautsky was such a renegade and Lenin is like, this guy sucks. Like, he, because the question of, was, is our allegiance to the people, the proletariat internationally, are we putting down a horizon that says that we will not form an alliance with the national bourgeoisie to continue this pointless war to massacre you know, people across borders? Or are we gonna say that there's this thing called communism that is this horizon and we are going to orient to it and end this war and not actually form that alliance and, and form a new idea of who the, who the people actually are? And um, I think we're in a similar kind of moment where we have to make that same decision. So some of what we've been talking about up to this point is like the, the minutia of that, but I don't think like we should abandon the horizon or, the, or our orientation to it. Dang it, I'm supposed to. Okay. Um, now, with that being said, I think uh, the, the key thing is that you, ha you have a tension between like the nuts and bolts organizing of like going door to door, doing the one on one conversations, like the type of activities that it takes to build an organization and this thing called political leadership or the orientation to the horizon that I'm trying to describe, right? So I used to think that like, it wasn't really political work unless you were doing that door-to-door -door grind of like institution building. I thought like anything else was just words, right? It's just talking. And uh, I was talking to a friend and he uh, pulled out, and I said that to a friend, and he pulled out this book and it was by Mahmoud Darwish, who is the uh, national poet of Palestine, right? And he pulls, he, he actually pulls three books out and he's like, he slams the first one on the, on the table and he's like, just words? This text, this, this short story, uh, forms the consciousness, the peopleness of the Palestinian people and when they decided to rise up and fight, they did not just arm themselves with rifles and, and, and bombs, but it was with these words that gave them a vision for a society, that gave them a peoplehood and orientation to that horizon that said, we are a free people and we will fight. And I think um, 
that has to be infused in the work that we're trying to do. And, uh, and unfortunately, that's not how it's often talked about. How we often talk about it is like, okay, we have this contract coming up, or we have this campaign to win this X demand, but it's not actually forming an articulation of new peoplehood and a new horizon. And I think that's like, that's the fundamental issue right now. And so questions of, um, of what are the political conditions of today. That's why I keep talking about the issue of governance. I'm trying to push us to think through what does society actually look like and what does the society that we want to exist in look like and how are we going to be or become that? And I think um, if we don't get back to that question, not just what is to be done, but what is the horizon and our orientation to it, then we won't be able to look at something like the Sanders campaign, understand it, and then say, how do we push beyond what is acceptable, or beyond what has already occurred, or beyond what people think is possible, and actually get to the work of transforming the society and becoming a new people. And I think uh, that, that right now like, may seem abstract, it may seem like it's just words, but actually it is, uh, it is the words, it is the beliefs, it is the, um, the orientation that allows us to build the solidarity necessary to do the transformation in a day-to-day -day sense. And as long as politics is limited in the day-to-day -to, -day to appealing to entitlements, um, to, to like this, these narrow, this narrowing of uh, political subjectivity, then I don't think we'll rise to the occasion of crumbling neoliberalism and the rise of fascism globally. This is a, these are global issues, and so we need a boldness to, to act. And so will DSA do that? Uh, that is the question. Um, that is what I'm trying to push. I think uh, there's a tendency to do what I call it and what has kind of been described as a pressure politics beyond, behind what's acceptable and then stripping anything that's divisive from what we do politically, a bit lowering the her, uh, political horizon in order to um, not have to force the, the, a choice politically about who are we going to be. So you don't like draw a line and say, okay, racism or transphobia or whatever is not acceptable, and then you find out who is, believes that and who doesn't, and then you try to bring the people who don't across that line to uh, push the struggle forward. That's the politics that we have to do. That's when you have an orientation to a horizon. That's when it's more than just words, but it's a unity between the words and the deeds, and I think that's what, uh, what we're going to have to struggle with in this organization, and what all of us have to struggle with, including you all here in Germany, where you have a, a, an insurgent, um, fascistic uh, uh, party on the move, and you need to have that bold vision, that new society. You need to call Kautsky a renegade and get down with this communist horizon. So, yeah. Okay, that was clearly uh, to Emily. <laughs> um, I think also with the question of base mobilization, uh, getting an or our organizations to grow and to be an actually meaningful, scary force. Um, we, we have seen this mass mobilization around the G20 where you have been very involved, which was a lot of energy on the street for many days actually, not just one. Um, but after this big event, there is a bit kind of like the hangover coming. What's next? What is the, aside from the legal trouble that follows, what is the, the positive outcome? How do we again also channel? You think the vision is what we lack? Like what uh, RL just described? This, where do we actually, up to which point do we go together? Or um, what do you, how would you analyze maybe the, or maybe you see a big a mobilization coming out of it, a lasting mobilization, I don't know. So we at least tried to be bold when last year, a week after the election, we publicly announced that the G20 summit would be the biggest anti-Trump demonstration on European ground. And I think we did that and we, there, it created some controversy and criticism. Uh, at me, directed at me for saying that because people feared that it would play into anti-American sentiment in Germany. Um, but uh, we tried to be bold and I think um, many of us ourselves were surprised how many people came because there was a lot of uh, preemptive uh, repression and repression afterwards. So people were right in fearing repression. Uh, people have sat in jail and are still in jail uh, now because of G20. 
And um, people, I think we've had a very um, long discussion, it's still going on, even in IL, about um, base building versus events. And I wish that it would be a more productive discussion and a more um, a, dis a discussion that would bring us forward instead of pitting things against each other because I do think we need both. I think we need the moments like the Women's March that you've organized and uh, the, the moments at the airport. Those were pictures that went around the world. We saw that in Germany and it gave us hope to see that. It did. And I hope that somehow, in, in some way, people saw the pictures uh, of, of Hamburg in, in Germany and that it touched them in some way and it made them feel like we're not alone in the struggle. It is connected in some way. People are fighting globally everywhere at the moment. But of course that's not enough. Of course we need to organize and fight to win. We need to win uh, struggles on the ground. We need to find comrades in, in our neighborhoods. We need to to fight for better working conditions and better living conditions and affordable housing. And we need people to know that communists or socialists are not just people uh, who are going to do the next riot, but that we're at their side and fighting for, for their survival as well. Of course we need that. And so I don't really see why um, white can't go together and why it can't be a, a productive relationship with each other because at the same time when we, when we organize with tenants, when um, we organize in our neighborhoods, what are we going to tell them? You know, it, it can't just be enough to organize uh, for better housing because then we're just, uh, then we're not much better than the Socialist Party. So if we want revolution, we need to speak about that as well. And we talked a lot about, we use the words of rebellion and hope a lot when we talked about Hamburg because I do believe that those moments when we all come together in our different struggles, that they're very powerful, uh, even if you're not there. Um, yeah, so I wish we could have a more productive relationship of how that works together. And in, I mean, that's a theory, but in practicality, it's a lot about how do you allocate resources? How do you allocate time? Who gets enough attention? And of course, I guess like the big images of Hamburg have gotten a lot of attention and the, the important solid work that our comrades have been doing on the ground in, in their neighborhoods, in, at their workplace, isn't getting enough attention in comparison to that. Um, Maga, I would maybe give that back to you. Do you feel uh, <laughs> hopeful? hopeful? Yeah, you, no, uh, um, yes. not just hopeful, yes. but also do you feel you channel the energy from the Women's March? Because it was also, I think, the biggest demonstration in a very long time nationwide was like this March, um, not this year, but last year. Yeah, this is a great question. And I think like hearing you talk about it, like I started to beam because... I do think that um, for all the criticisms that we have and should have about like mobilizations, they're, they're very important sort of um, points of reference for the left and not just sort of like because we, we shouldn't, like sometimes we do it out of ritual like May 1st or whatever, but like I want to sort of bring it back to my um, political history which has a lot to do with the uh, um, women's strike which is I was 13 years old when, and living in Los Angeles, I was a high school student, sophomore, um, in 2006 when the like largest immigrant rights demonstrations, which before the Women's uh, March were the largest demonstrations in US history, um, were happening around against a policy called HR 4437 that would have criminalized um, anyone who tried to aid um, immigrants in the state of California which would have been practically everyone because we're the majority in California. But, um, but uh, that day I remember sort of like hearing whispers in my family of like, um, we had heard it on the radio that, you know, there was gonna be a, a sort of strike, but no one really knew, I and mean, it was a political strike, right? It was not a workplace strike. I think this is a really, really important distinction that I like to make because it was a sort of, um, it was an identity-based strike. And um, the, the sort of identity, like some, one of the sort of slogans was, imagine a day without a Mexican. Um, and it obviously wasn't just Mexican, there were a lot of Central American folks that were also getting swept up in the anti-immigration um, sort of backlash. But, but so it was like this sort of um, political strike and we were like, is it really gonna happen? There were like no, like, there weren't like official unions that were like leading the demonstration. It was mostly the Catholic Church and the radio 
And so on the day of, my parents told, I was still in high school, so my parents were like, we're not gonna go, to, you're not gonna go to school today, and we're not gonna go to work. And we went out on the street, and you just saw like swarms of people sort of walking down the street because like a bunch of the bus lines were shut down. Um, the following day, like, there was one person that went to school because their like parents forced them to. But other than that, there was like no one at school. You couldn't pump gas on that day because all the gas stations were shut down. Um, major industries were just sort of like non, the entire city really in, in a way was non-functional. And I think this is important because um, it, to say that this was like as close as I've ever seen to a general strike in my life. And it was not sort of organized under the banner of the general strike. So fast forward to you know last year when we started um, organizing the international women's strike, it was a sort of similar um, experience of like like is anyone even gonna come out? Like what is this even gonna look like? And then like I already mentioned, there were sort of school districts that where it happened, and we're hoping for like similar things this year. And it was also an international call, right? So like that's one of the inspiring things to see. Um, in in the U.S., there are 50 cities that um, had strikes. But like globally that we know of, also in 50 countries there were um, women's strikes. And like the sort of umbrella um, banner of like the sorts of activities that people sort of autonomously decided were important to them like really ranged. And I thought that was like a really cool thing. So I, one of the examples that I always give is that in, in San Salvador, El Salvador, there was a demonstration of transgender women and um, allies that sort of took the streets as part of like the main sort of locus of their um, action. And then in Melbourne, a thousand care workers walked out of their jobs, so they did a walkout. And all of this took place under the banner of um, international women's strike. And I think one of the last things that I'll add is um, exactly this sort of question of like, well, March 8th was one day, and sort of we've been doing all this work together. Like, we had a really serious decision to make, like, what do we do after March 8th, after the day is over? Um, we were successful in sort of, like, articulating a, a group of people that otherwise wouldn't have been. But one of the sort of important things for me was also to think about, like, who are the people that we wanted to be participating in this who were not? And what sorts of, like, strat strategic things can we be doing to sort of next year do some work to, like, include those people? Because, you know, it's one thing for us to say we have the correct socialist politics, uh, socialist feminist politics, or, like, Marxist feminist politics. And another thing for that to not, like, um, reverberate with, like, um, undocumented uh, care workers, which is something that I care a lot about. So one of the things that some of us within the sort of International Women's Strike New York City crew did was we started doing, going into the streets and into the streets, um, sort of started like uh, making connections with these um, immigrant women worker co op or immigrant women led, some of them are not immigrant women, some of them are like construction worker, um, day laborer sort of centers, but these co ops and sort of started doing interviews um, that ended up, you know, we ended up publishing with uh, some of our professor friends in the, at the new school, um, but sort of getting a better understanding of like what concerns these folks had and how our sort of campaigns could do better to address those things in the long run. And uh, this year, you know, we're really hoping that those sort of, we'll see the fruits of those um, activities. And, you know, this was an example for us of like, learning how to do militant inquiry after the day of um, the strike because we had that opportunity. I, I just wanted to add really quickly something more concrete in the sense of uh, when you have an orientation to a horizon that can manifest not just in event politics but in the base building itself. And I think, um, so I'll give you two, two quick examples. So. The Young Lords in um, New York were this mostly Puerto Rican um, organization. What they did was they started doing door-to-door -door, uh, testing for tuberculosis. And they would find out you know, that these communities that were incredibly poor, mostly um, uh, Puerto Rican, um, but also black people, a, a number of, you know how New York is, it's a bazillion different types of people in, in, these, in these communities, but poor. And that the hospitals were not actually geared towards um, providing uh, quality care for people from these neighborhoods. And so they had an articulation of a different type of society, a socialized health, in which like people's well-being would be taken care of and that there would be a new type of society where that would exist. And they wanted to try to create that. So 
not only did they um, engage the people door to door, but they also organized uh, doctors and nurses in the hospital um, and administrators and, and built a connection across that division, which is, has been referenced a little bit um, uh, previously. And so what happened was they created, they used that base building, that door to door relationship building and developing the people in that neighborhood to be leaders, like for, to lead society, right? So what do I mean by that? Um, well, what happened was they went and they seized the hospital. Like they, they created an event by seizing the hospital from the base building work that they had done in the community. And so um, they were able to do something that had a more enduring uh, 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 um, impact. And it wasn't just a one-off spectacle, but rather they had mobilized an actual base to do long-term occupation of, of this target in order to transform it into a, 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 a something, an institution that was more consistent with their new vision of society and their new idea of who they were going to be, what this community was going to mean, what kind of people they were. And I think like, you can get that type of um, uh, 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 type of transformative leap through um, regard with regards to an event from that end of base building, but also the other end in the sense of an event can be happening, like say um, Mike Brown gets killed in Ferguson, and um, his there's blood in the street still. I saw this video. You know, there's blood still on the street. Um, there's the stain of his, of his flesh is right there, right? And these people are all gathered around it, just people in the neighborhood. And there's this unnamed, like I don't even know who these people were, but there was some sort of cadre developed um, political organization that entered that event, right? And uh, they start agitating the crowd. And they're, and they're trained in how to agitate because they're, they're part of that community and they do this kind of... Um, uh, political work one on one. So they're agitating the people and they're saying stuff like, all you gangbangers, all you bloods and crips, those are like two big gangs in the, in the, in the United States. They're like, y'all need to put on for your people. Like, and they were articulating a new way in which gangs would function in their idea of, of society, who this community was going to be. And so then people in the crowd were like, yeah, where the blood's at? Where my GD's at? And I was like, whoa, what is about to happen? And what happened was they went out and burned down the quick trip and started a rebellion that launched a spark that like, lit the imagination of the entire world. And that started from people on the ground who had developed the skills of agitation, of, of organizing through this type of person-to-person -person engagement that allowed them to spark it. Now here's the problem. After that event happens, other machines that know how to do this sort of organizing work, day-to-day -day grind type work, came in and contained the rebellion and ultimately destroyed it. And so if you don't have the base building, you can't create events that have long-term enduring impact, which the hospital changed and you know, they actually reformed it. And you can't take advantage of the rupture that happens socially when you have an event that um, uh, creates a sort of opening for a new articulation of society to occur. And so the, uh, uh, just because I'm talking about these words and this idea of orientation to a horizon doesn't mean that I'm saying that you can't do that work, you can't orient yourself through the actual base building, institution building, people building one by one um, work. It's a, it's a, that forms the basis for which one defines like the, the institution, but the ideas and the articulation, the words, the, the beliefs, the peoplehood, gets you that orientation. Thank you very much. Um, I think you two mentioned uh, different keywords that lead to the last part. Um, I confused everyone a little bit by changing around the order of topic and question. <laughs> but um, we talked before about organizational forums and you talked about radical inquiry, you talked about leadership right now. Um, it's, it's about abilities, the abilities to agitate, the ability to find out what the people want that are on the street, things like that. And so I would like to start that last kind of block of our discussion with you, Emily, because I, in comparison to my experience in the US, I do feel that there is a huge hesitancy within the German left to anything leadership. It has a very unhappy translation. If you think about leader to Führer, everyone gets a historic imagination that you don't really want to be associated with. Um, but it's, it, it's like almost a fear of like authoritarianism. Can you maybe 
give a very short, like, what your opinion is on, on is that healthy or should we overcome it? <laughs> yeah, I think um, I was thinking of uh, activists, uh, climate justice activists in Germany who tried to uh, translate a brochure on organizing and they stumbled upon the word leadership and they had a really difficult time to, to translate it because really you would need a cultural translation rather than than a, a language translation. And I'd be really interested because I'm curious to see whether we even all, or you all, share the same uh, understanding of what leadership is. Um, because, yeah, as you mentioned, like the literal translation for leadership in Germany has, has the root of Führer. And so obviously that's nothing that progressive movements would use, except for the word Führerschein, which means driver's license. I'm very confused about this. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> So and so, I think that's the root of of of, uh, of that problem. But also, I guess the distancing's ourselves from uh, from Stalinism, from uh, from an experience of uh, how socialism can go wrong in in Europe, um, and of course, for the radical left to come from a tradition of the autonomous movement, who've who've really focused very strongly on on horizontalism, on the criticisms of hierarchy, etc. And I think it's quite interesting, even in IL, in the organization that I'm in, that we have different traditions, which, is, which, which means that we're rich in different cultures where we come from, but it's also so frustrating because obviously everyone has a different understanding and there's people come from the roots of, of Leninist organizing or from anarchist organizing, so you can imagine that that can be a very frustrating endeavor. But... Um, I guess my opinion on it, I'd be interested in hearing your, your understanding of leadership because uh, what I've heard is things that go in the direction of orientation, and I'd say that's a good thing, wanting to, to provide orientation to movements. Um, and I've heard uh, it understood as kind of a personal thing, which I think can also be a good thing like in the sense of cadres, in the sense of giving people responsibility, of empowering people to take on responsibility, etc. And if you'd ask me personally, I'd say giving people permission to shine by using the skills that they have and empowering them to speak up is a good thing. And that doesn't mean that you need to shadow out others, but that you, by shining yourself, you give others permission to shine as well. <laughs> yeah, I think this is a very important question, uh, and Katie and I have a, one of our formative kind of political experiences is in an effort to democratize a uh, trade union in California, um, the Graduate Student Union, and so there is certainly a contestation about the question of power in an organization that we were very interested in carrying forward and we were absolutely opposed as a collective to a model of um, organization in which a president of the union could dictate for the entire membership the, the direction and the course of organizing and um, in relation to whom all other organizers would be subordinated. And I think that that is absolutely necessary not only in a kind of principled way, like p as a kind of anti-authoritarian um, orientation, but also practically because um, there's a limit, I would say, to the possibility of um, uh, broad-based strike activity or insurrectionary activity um, that's directed um, in such a hierarchical way. So I think that in order to have an effective strike, there needs to be a kind of um, uh, activation and democratization and vitalization of, um, of organs um, that are decision-making organs and that are organizing bodies at um, very uh, on-the-ground level, local level. So in the case of the university, it's, it's a matter of the actual individual departments um, in, in the university, to actually have people in every department who are um, organizing actively, who are actively shaping the course of, the, of a campaign or, a, or an effort, yeah, a campaign of one sort or another, and that that's the best way to um, kind of build a, a collective power. And 
I want to say one other thing about the question of leadership. Um, two things I would say. One is that um, it's, I think there's a feminist point to make here, which is that there's a question of how we imagine leadership and how we imagine um, a person embodying the characteristics of leadership. And I think that um, it's that there are ways of being um, a, a kind of active um, a force within a group that are very attuned to and attentive to the forms of dependency and relationship upon which a group relies and on which it's based and that are responsive to uh, the kind of embeddedness of one within a social body and a social um, group and that are um, interested in supporting the initiatives of others and listening to the different interests and desires that, um, that emerge within a room and somehow trying to figure out ways to bridge um, those different interests and desires to help create a sense of a collective purpose, right? So these are leadership functions that, um, that I think it's good for us to kind of recognize as such. The one thing I want to say about sort of the pitfall of a model of leaderlessness, and this is something that we had during the Occupy movement, and, and I would say I was very uh, much a leader in the Occupy Cal movement, but I disavowed it very actively at the time, and I said, no, this, this movement does not have leaders. Um, you know, this is a leaderless movement, and I think that there's a way in which that, that disavowal is also a disavowal of the possibility for forms of hierarchy and power within an organization, and that it's better to have um, some recognition of power relations in an organization so that they can be addressed and actively confronted. And so the model of leaderlessness, I think, does have a kind of pitfall built into it that it's important for us to be attentive to. I, yeah, I would like to hear Katie too, and would maybe add as a uh, side question to that to also mention maybe the the interaction between leadership and competence, like the this enabling people, teaching them to be good leaders, and not just to appear the most outspoken person. <laughs> maybe like uh, with that in mind, that would be great from your experience, preferably. Yeah, um, I mean, I certainly agree with everything that Emily and Amanda have said about leadership. Um, I actually just wanted to recommend a kind of classic short political piece that touches on the point Amanda just made um, that was written by a um, lesbian feminist writer from Berkeley in the 70s. The piece is called The Tyranny of Leaderlessness. So the tyranny of organizations that say they don't have leaders. And the idea is, of course, you know, Leaders um, emerge organically in any social grouping. And um, I think that, that brings me to the, the main point I wanted to make, which is actually a slight reframing of the question for me. Um, the question of leaders or not is, is less important than the question of what is the structure of the organization. I think that's a much more fundamental, critical question that everyone on the left should be thinking of. Um, And I just wanted to offer up um, <coughs> another example um, from my research um, of um, unions that I think have, have actually provided very um, good models. And I'll say what the models are, and then I'll explain why I think these are good models. Um, so the, the dock workers unions in Chile and in Spain, coincidentally, have quite a similar um, model. And it's um, about as far away from a bureaucratic model of trade unionism as you could get. So the model is um, all power resides at the most local level, so at the worksite union. And that is the primary decision-making space. And decisions begin um, in assemblies of all the workers at the local worksite. That's the first decision-making space. From there, um, local work sites are grouped into regions, and there are regional level assemblies. And then from there, there's a national assembly with representatives from the region and so on. And um, 
you know, what this model is, is a, a model of truly bottom-up democracy. So a non-representational democracy, a direct democracy from the most local level of the people directly affected by the decisions. And it forces everyone in the organization to take responsibility for, um, for making decisions, right? You, the decisions you take are the decisions you will implement as part of your organization. And you have to be part of the debate and the discussion and the collective process. And um, uh, there are no executive members in these organizations. There are, uh, well, certainly in Chile, there are what are called voceros, or spokespeople, right? So you're not um, an executive empowered to make decisions by yourself. You're a spokesperson reporting on the decisions of the assembly, and you can be voted out at any time, and your position is a short-term position. Um, it's rotational. Um, so it's, quite, it's a model of a quite radical democracy. And um, I think what's so powerful about this, again, is that it forces everybody in the organization to um, become a responsible decision maker, to not, um, to not delegate your, um, your, your internal process to someone else and to know that you'll be responsible for implementing that decision as well. And it doesn't depend on any particular individuals to carry forth the work of the organization. And it's also incredibly flexible. Um, you know, it makes it very um, possible to make very strong shifts in the orientation of the organization. So I think that um, you know this exact model is not replicable in every situation, but I think it's instructive. And um, the idea is, yeah, for you know to to think about how do we create structures where not everybody is necessarily a leader in the traditional sense, but everybody is um, exercising the function of participating in developing the orientation of the organization that they're participating in. And um, I think those are the questions we should be thinking about. Thanks. Uh, so I came out of the Occupy movement too, um, and I was, yes, that disavowal of all, any and all leadership was like my um, modus operandi as well. Like, and looking back on it, it's just like, that was really dumb. <laughs> that was a ter that, that's, why, that's part of why we failed. I think, um, if leaders and leadership uh, weren't important, then uh, the U.S. government wouldn't exterminate and kill us. Um, that's just a, a fact. Uh, the ability to um, orient a people, to make a people, to cut to the core of political questions, to, um, to be part of the project, the collective project of uh, uh, move, transforming society, like these, there are various roles to play within that and there are skills associated with those roles that you have to, you just develop. Like, um, and the key thing to me is developing structures that allow for um, a, a number of different roles to be one recognized as we've said. So for example, the person that uh, cooks food, that's a leader. Like the person that knows how to um, how to get beyond like the the con the, per the the conflict between people and cut to that political question, whether that's a person that talks a lot or talks one time, that person is a leader. You know, um, these things are significant. That's what helps shape the orientation to the horizon. And I think uh, if we want to both recognize leadership as important, understand that it's both a social force, but it is also something borrowed. Uh, because politics resides with the people, so a leader is borrowing that ability to kind of shape that orientation rather than possessing it in, in and of themselves like by simply existing. I think um, if we begin to understand it that way and then begin to understand we have to respect that, and I know like that could be <laughs> kind of strange coming from somebody who's an elected leader in, a, in an organization, but as as I've been in various political organizations, understanding a respect for leadership is actually important. Um, and that dis when decisions are made collectively, um, 
being able to move on them is important and being able to debate on them is important. And so what are the positional relationships that facilitate each of those things, both the discussion and the action? And I think um, if we reject leadership or if we are um, lacking an ambition, if we are um, um, shirking the responsibility of it, then it's very hard to kind of forge that collective orientation to the horizon. And um, I think like the, the last thing I'll say about it is, uh, is this issue of leadership is, is important because ultimately we want the poor and the dispossessed, uh, the, the proletariat to lead society. Like that's the point, um, to, at least to me. Uh, uh, so this question of leadership is significant because right now it's the bourgeoisie that leads society. We live under a dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. Um, that's who can, that is what the state is used for. It's used to suppress the proletariat, used to suppress poor people, it's used to suppress the dispossessed, it's used to suppress various um, uh, ethnic and, and gender identities in order to preserve the recomposition of class hierarchy and ultimately the leadership or dictatorship of that bourgeoisie. And I want to upend that process. And so developing leaders is crucial to being able to do it through the process of organizing. And that's why base building is important because base building is about developing the people's capacity to lead society and respecting that, that uh, leadership and respecting that, that process is crucial. And so I think we're at a, a turning point, I think politically, at least in the United States, where if we have fascists on the rise, and people that are out here ready to kill us, you know, Heather Heyer got killed, and she was a leader. It's important to respect that. We're seeing what leadership really means. Colin Kaepernick sat his butt down, and the NFL is in crisis. You know, that was a leader, and we're seeing the effect that that can have on the people. And I think, like, saying that that's bad, or that that's something to be avoided or something to see as shameful um, limits our ability to mobilize um, um, the people and create that orientation to a horizon. So we both need the individuals that develop leadership skills, but we also need the structures that facilitate that process of development, not just for individuals, but ultimately for the class to develop the power, independent power necessary to truly lead society as the part of materializing this horizon that I keep talking about. Thank you very much. We actually have 15 minutes left. So there is a possibility to ask some questions. There's so much more to say. Unfortunately, we skipped through <laughs> a lot of things, but the time is, as always, limited. Um, I think there is a microphone, and Danielle, maybe... Uh, I actually can't see anything, but I think there is one standing next to the... <laughs> yes. Right? Yes. Ah, oh, beautiful. Next to the fireplace. Right here. Anyone else? I'm, a, I'm the only, only one? Okay, cool. Um, yeah. yeah, so uh, as an American living in Berlin, it was really interesting to get a perspective that um, I'm not used to actually, even though I'm from the US, being here for like, like four or five years. But um, my, appro my uh, introduction into leftist, socialist, communist politics actually came here and not in the United States. So, um, you know, Trump, I guess, radicalized me <laughs> in a way, seeing that here, which was a lot easier because these ideas are more prevalent. Um, as organizers in the United States, have you seen, um, you know, I, I mean, obviously the, the numbers of deep people joining DSA and such have, have radically increased, um, but the activity amongst these people, particularly at my age, I'm, I'm 25 and a university student and whatnot, um, has this, um, how has this kind of, con uh, um, battled against the traditional American approach towards, or attitudes towards socialism and communism that are so negative. Um, because for me, it's obviously different, you know, here, and being able to then go back and look at the United States and being like, okay, really cool seeing these organizations. I hope that, you know, you know, they do well. And the pictures of, 
you know, the inverse of, of, of what we talked between um, uh, Hamburg and, and um, uh, LaGuardia Airport and such, how those, you know, uh, moments of hope generated for, for someone like myself who, have, who has a connection to both. So um, that and to um, the mobilization of groups that then kind of counteract that, like the alt-right, as was mentioned in, at the beginning. Um, do you see them threatening then, I guess, people like myself who have been introduced into these politics, um, you know, very recently and very much affected in the sense of, of kind of this, you know, white bourgeois approach to politics that the United States has. Um, is there any way that then your organizations in the U.S. can kind of counteract this, which is kind of the norm, although it tries to pretend itself to be this, um, you know, alternative movement. So, thank you. Just briefly on the question of fighting the far right in the U.S. right now, I think that um, there have been a number of sites of struggle against the far right and approaches to that struggle. Um, and I think that they range from um, kind of more militant Antifa um, uh, efforts to physically prevent uh, members of the alt-right from gathering in public to strategies that involve an attempt to kind of create a sense that the majority opposes that politics through mass mobilizations. And to some extent, these different positions polarize in terms of anarchist or socialist approaches to opposing the alt-right. And I think one thing that was very interesting after Charlottesville was the the sense that those approaches could have something to say to each other and could actually, um, you know, work in concert in some way. And so that's something that I'm very inspired by. And I do think that there was a, let's say, temporary tactical victory against the alt-right this summer in the U.S. And we'll see kind of where things go in the next um, phase when... Richard Spencer, in particular, is targeting university campuses, and so we'll have a number of confrontations this spring. Just to get in on that quickly, in, so I went to Charlottesville two days after Heather Hare was killed by, the, um, by a fascist, and um, one of the things that I observed there was that, uh, yes, people were able to mobilize um, to fight off the the Nazis on the days of, of uh, their descendants or emergence um, uh, in the city, uh, but there's, there wasn't so much an illumination of the continuity between the eliminationist politics that already are part of um, the state and part of capitalism vis-a-vis -vis marginalized people as there was for, uh, and, and its continuity to like the, the eliminationist rhetoric and, and then actual politics of these Nazis. So a concrete example of that is the Nazis tried to run into a mostly black project in Charlottesville and they had guns and everything. And um, some gang members, um, residents, as well as like protesters from around the country um, stood up to them and wouldn't let them come into the, um, into the project, a housing project in the United States, like you know, public housing. So um, these are poor black people that were um, able to repel uh, the Nazis from coming in. Now the interesting thing is that they, the, there's a local organization that organizes the public housing residents that was, knew that the Nazis were gonna try to come in there. And they actually went and told the city government, the Nazis are planning to run into this, pro this housing project and attack black people here. And the city government wouldn't take any affirmative steps to stop it, right? Then I, when I got to the city, I came to find out that uh, 
the city government has also targeted this same housing project to be a mixed income development, which means that rather than the Nazis coming in and eliminating these black people from this public sphere, I mean from this public housing, it's actually gonna be the police when they come to redevelop it. And so is there going to be a resistance or, or a, a, an intervention when that happens? And can we illuminate the continuity between what's happening politically under normal circumstances and the eliminationist um, uh, politics of fascism as it's entering this, this sphere and, and gaining legitimacy publicly. I think that's, that's, a, that's a challenge, and I think that's a challenge globally because uh, the fascists are actually articulating a vision of society that rises to the crisis that we're facing today. And is the left doing that? Or is our socialists doing that? Are our communists doing that? And I'd say no, like because the communists need to have, an, or the socialists or whomever needs to articulate that continuity, that the, what the world that the fascists want to exist is imminent, not in the sense that like it's inevitable, but rather the pieces of it are already here and that um, we need to illuminate that and have a, a counter response. And we have to have a belief that revolution is also imminent, that the pieces of it exist here in the now and need to be cohered, and that is our historical mission. And I think if we begin to think that way, rather than simply going to the event or the spectacle and trying to manage who has the right to speak within this existing status quo, and, and I don't think that's gonna work to fight off the fascists and to deal with the crisis. I think we need to actually believe in revolution, believe in its imminence, and actually commit to the people and provide that leadership to direct a new, uh, us towards a new society uh, with a new basis and a new foundation and a new people. Uh, I'm gonna say something uh, from a German perspective to that because I would absolutely agree with you that um, we need to do both and Antifa alone is not enough. Uh, in Germany, and I don't know if this is, uh, this is common knowledge in the US, but asylum seekers and refugees housing are being attacked every day. It's, it's an epidemic. It's not even talked about enough in Germany. There was a, a neo-Nazi terrorist cell that murdered people over 10 years, and they were funded by the German, uh, the German Secret Service. And um, so, and who looked away, who, who deleted files, who until this day is preventing a, a real um, a cover up of, of, or is covering up uh, what happened there. Um, and so we need to be at the side of those who are under attack by the far right right now um, and offer our support and listen to what they have to say and what they need and support them. Uh, we need to take away the spaces that are being taken by the far right in Germany as well and um, prevent activate civil society, uh, take away their spaces when they speak publicly, kind of like uh, Berkeley did with, when, when Milo talked, um, take away their spaces, make sure that they can't march, uh, sit down when we, when we can, um, and, and block the roads where they want to march, but Antifa at the same time is not enough, and that's uh, where I'm gonna totally agree with, with what you said, RL, um, that the far right is, is gaining a momentum because they're offering a solution to crisis, to a crisis of governance, to a, a neoliberal crisis, and they're offering, a, they have an empty uh, promise, which is they're blaming who's not to blame, they're blaming refugees and migrants, and uh, they're offering something that won't help, which is by excluding people who are marginalized. And um, so what we need to do is offer solutions from the left, offer, um, a left global uprising against this far right global uprising. And so I think that's multiple levels on which we're acting in the US and in Germany and all throughout Europe at the moment. Yeah. Yes, next person, thank you. Hi, I'm Kathleen. Um, thank you so much for the, the contributions. And I think um, what's really significant is that we are at a moment of political crisis where um, we have, <laughs> continuing in the, in, in the US, what's been, of course, not just one year of nightmares, although things have gotten significantly worse under Trump, but, but really um, decades of ongoing crisis that hasn't been addressed by um, either political party. Um, outside of the real intense racism and scapegoating um, of the Republican Party um, as they, they search to blame people um, as the same time that they're going after uh, kind of a naked money grab um, from, from the top. Um, 
And I think what's significant is that we started out last year, exactly a year ago, with the Women's March that happened all around the world. And we've seen this here in Berlin. There were 2,000 people who marched. We started at the AfD, Alternative for Deutschland, offices, and we marched down um, to the US Embassy um, to reject both kind of versions of, of um, anti-immigrant scapegoating and, and xenophobia. I just want to make a quick pitch. Tomorrow, there's another Women's March at Brandenburger Tor at 11 AM. And there's a big political discussion happening about what direction um, we go in. And what's really important is there's also a contingent for Ahed Tamimi, Palestinian teenager, um, who's been um, arrested by occupation forces um, in Israel. And there's going to be a solidarity contingent for her tomorrow. So I want to make a pitch of where we started a year ago and where we go forward. There's a lot of discussion and there's a lot of debate, um, but important that we also join and, and show our solidarity with um, people right now who, who are fighting for their freedom. So 11 a.m. at Brandenburger Tour tomorrow. Sorry, that wasn't a question. Okay, next, me? Yes, okay. Hi, my name is Lisa. Thank you very much for your great analysis and your inspiring experience in organizing and your political work. And I have rather a practical question. I'm wondering, in your organizing, how do you deal with people who voice racist or homophobic viewpoints, like practically how do you incorporate that or how do you deal with that in your political work? Thanks. Um, so that's something I've certainly had some experience with um, working in the trade union movement. Um, these are just kind of broad guidelines, I would say. Um, I think that, um, first of all, you do have to deal with these things, right? It's, um, it's sometimes convenient to pretend that somebody hasn't said something that they've said, but that's um, not in line with our principles and our values, and it's just simply unhelpful for our organizing in the long term. If we don't address these um, divisions and these prejudices, we're not gonna have the kind of unified movements that we need to be successful. Um, I think that um, one, one way I see people responding to this sometimes is to adopt a kind of um, holier than thou, um, quite, you know, kind of condescending posture of, oh, you know, how, like, how, can, how can you be so ignorant and um, to kind of create a whole lot of distance, right, and, and a kind of talking down. And I don't think that that's the right way to deal with it either. I think that um, you need to be honest about the position somebody's taking, and you need to give them the respect of disagreeing with them. Um, and, and talking to them in the respectful way that you would want somebody to talk to you when, you, when you're in the wrong, because we're all in the wrong in different times in different ways. Um, and I, I, I think that, um, you know, those conversations don't always go the, the, the way we want them to. We don't always succeed in changing people's minds. But um, I think that sometimes it can actually be quite surprising. Um, you know, people don't always have as entrenched positions as they might seem to from the onset. It might be that people have a very superficial impression about something and they're actually quite open to um, hearing new information. That may or may not be the case. It also may be the case that you have an honest conversation, an honest, respectful, pushing conversation with someone, and it doesn't change their mind in the moment, but it plants a seed, and over time, their position changes. And um, so I, I would say those are, some, those are some broad general guidelines that I've found helpful in having those, those conversations which are difficult to have but are so necessary. Yeah. I think it has to be collective also, like, uh, like uh, the, cause the problem isn't contained within the individual per se, though it's easy for us to be emotionally triggered by like what this person is saying that's immediately in front of me. But one of the, and that's a challenge that I feel personally, like there's, there's stuff that happens where I'm just like, uh, this is some racist bullshit, like, and I'm, I'm really upset about it, right? But um, the forces bringing about the behavior that are the opponent directly in front of me are, are, are obscured to me. They're beyond the, the actual individual. And so the only way to actually deal with it is to create collective 
engagement on, on these issues. I'll give you like a concrete example. Like um, the, in some unions back in the day in the United States, there used to be like an actual dividing line and all the black people would be on this side and the white people would be on that side. And that's how they actually would have meetings. And um, so literally they had to like deal with this division and the white people that were pissed off about like being integrated had to, like first of all, it wasn't all the white people that like believed in this shit, right? Like there were some that did and some that didn't. So they had to actually touch that line, you know, that division and say, we're not gonna, like we're gonna do something differently now. We're gonna have a different horizon and then use that to orient the people. So then the people that are against it emerge and the people who are for it emerge. And then you try to win over across that line the people that are um, against the integration, you know? And they, some unions were able to do this successfully. And so I think if we, if we don't have it incorporated into a collective vision of society as a whole, and then that being re reproduced and reinforced through um, political, collective political practices, if it all becomes reduced simply to moralism between individuals, then I, I think like we'll lose. So that's why there are organizations that take this seriously, that, that look at the way that social divisions are used to reproduce hierarchies and, and ultimately destroy movements. And so they develop values and a vision and a horizon of peopleness, of solidarity from the outset, that this is what this organization is about when, and this is what it means to be a member. And then that creates the basis to actually hold individuals accountable and then to have like a process of reconciliation. But without clearly stating a horizon Horizon, without clearly stating values and principles, um, there's, then it just becomes an issue of my moral um, uh, uh, assertion versus yours. And I think if that's how this stuff gets reduced, then we, we won't win. But if it's part and parcel to the work of transforming society, um, and it's frontal, then that's the, the way to engage it. I would, I would push back on some of that a little bit, actually, just because I think sometimes violence is justified. <laughs> like, if there's like a literal Nazi in your group, like, you can punch them in the face, and like, you know what I mean? Like, it's, I think that with all these questions, the way to avoid moralizing it, because I think at the end of the day, like, if someone's saying something that's like racist or misogynistic or homophobic to me. I have every right to punch them in the face, and, like use violence against them. But I have to sort of also consider my position within this organization. Is this actually, you know, there are pros and cons to doing that. The pros is that this person may think twice the next time about doing it again. The, you know, the pros that it'll feel good to me, that I like was able to cause harm to this person that caused harm to me. Um, but it's exactly going back to this question, like there are sort of consequences to that as well. And I, I'm not, and that's a sort of like very egregious example, but like I think call out culture, so-called call out culture is also an example of this like sort of anger that's I think is in a lot of instances justified um, and righteous, but, but that sort of has these like um, consequences where like I've seen a lot of it sort of devolve into um, like people feeling like very like isolated ultimately. So like it has the consequence of being like, well then no one had my back and, or like sort of this is the only way to deal with it and there aren't like institutional ways to deal with it and like, you know, sort of becomes a substitute for thinking structurally about like issues in the organization. Um, and I think they're like sort of, we're entering a moment where I think a lot of people have, at least myself, including a lot of my comrades, have felt sort of exhausted or like burned out from sort of like this valorizing of righteous anger um, around questions of like racism, sexism, homophobia, which again, I'm, I'm not in a position to sort of moralize about it. Um, but sort of now we're sort of entering into a moment where it's like, okay, if those are the actually if there are actually repercussions to solely dealing with sort of conflict around identity on the basis of this like valorizing of this righteous anger, like what are other alternatives? And I think one of the things that I think a lot about like st in terms of structure is, is the sort of work of um, this black communist feminist Claudia Jones who was part of the Communist Party USA uh, Stalinist group 
but <laughs> but she's really amazing because um, one of the things that they were able to do in in the CP at this time was sort of actually develop um, like the political leadership of members of uh, the organization Black Women. So like dealing with this sort of intersectional, what we would call sort of intersectional. Uh, multiply oppressed sort of subjectivity and like allowing and giving this person the space and the platform to sort of write these incredible polemics within the organization that then the organization was sort of like disseminate to everyone else in the organization where she talked directly about chauvinism and like you know how members of the party um, refused to sort of acknowledge like black women domestic workers for the most part as like important parts of the working class and how they needed to deal with that question or like also talked about, you know, there's in another part of her piece, she talks about like, you go to this dance and no one, none of the white male comrades want to dance with the black women comrades. And this was a, a, these were pieces that were then sort of disseminated within this bulletin, within this organization. Um, so yeah, structural uh, solutions are always probably more important than the immediate. If it's, if it's very short, we kind of... Yeah. <laughs> Um, there is one more thing that I think is quite important to say for all of you who have a translation and have a friendly voice in your ear. That's our comrade Lauren Balhorn who sits in the corner there. Thank you very much. I uh, wanted that to be recognized. <laughs> and um, yes. If nothing else works, throw a tomato. In uh, the 70s in Germany, there was quite a famous case of feminists throwing a tomato at the SDS student leader. So if nothing else works, maybe that's a, a concept of action that we should rethink. <laughs> I, I just wanted to add something really quickly. Um, I think MAGA makes a really good point. And I think that we're talking, like there's a whole range of ways to encounter things like racism and homophobia and a whole range of different contexts. And there are contexts in which like punch a Nazi is clearly the correct thing to do. Um, I think that there are contexts where we, I mean, if I, if I had to respond that way to all of the casual misogyny and homophobia that I encounter in daily life, my arms would fall off from punching everyone, right? So I, I just wanted to make a pitch for the kinds of casual um, remarks that we find all the time when we organize workers, when we organize tenants, um, in, in the kind of situations of daily life uh, in the left where we're trying to bring people around. I just wanna, I, I, I very much agree about the point of this is something that has, has to happen in general in a collective way at a structural level. But I do think that it's incumbent upon us as individuals to find ways to to speak to people that we're, um, that we're working with to, um, to, to make these conversations possible as well. And I think that in general, on the left, there's some there's some work to be done in finding ways to have those conversations in in these perhaps less charged, less violent situations. Um, so I just wanted to say that. Yeah. Thank you very much. We're kind of fading out finally because we weren't 100% sure how much time we have, and so we use every additional minute we get. And uh, thank you for this <laughs> wrapping up the answer to the question. I think. But now everyone free to go and thank you to our guests. <laughs>